My name is Ramal Maria. I'm a DevOps lead at Red Software, which is part of the Hollywood group. And I'm involved with uh, making sure that everything gets deployed as quickly as possible. And ensuring that whatever we deploy, we deploy Good safely, uh, securely. Um, we use containers where we need to. Welcome to those of you who are attending yeah, this talk. Anything that comes with deployment. I'm also a Microsoft Azure MVP in Azure. Really honest, I highly enjoy it. Well, I have a degree in quantum computing. And today we will be talking a bit about how we will develop applications with Python using Azure functions. In the previous talk, you will join the. Some of the questions were asked around what if there's an influx of people requesting data points when API? How do we have that, that case? Like, okay, we're building this now. What happens in production? We offer the services to our clients, and people need data now. So, how do we build systems that, that scale well? What we currently have to other municipalities or other countries, how how is that going to how because our code is stable, but how do we scale? And Azure functions allow you to do that in the sense that if we contrast that with the historical way of okay, in today's world, there's three ways on how we can deploy this function. There's there's the traditional services where upfront you buy hardware and more But at some time that hardware is not enough and you have to provision more hardware. And as our cost increase or our demand on our services increase, you have to buy more hardware to keep up, up to stand with what, what our service level agreements are. And what um, tends to happen is that you know, the, the these steps that you see are where we over provision We provision more than what we need. We provision as much as our highest people. But at certain times of the year, we don't have that high. So what happens then? We have infrastructure where we are just paying money for something that we only need for 10% of the year. And that happens kind of in this. So what service allows you to do is that you can use what you need at any point of the year, any time that you want. And you only pay for what you need. If, if the demand on your services are high, then you pay for that. And similarly, when it's low, a bit longer. So on Azure, there's multiple service services. Um, so uh, traditionally, so when we wanted API, we have uh, provision servers. That that's not the case anymore. So there are um, options where you can have serverless environment. Where, although it, the word serverless is a bit misunderstood, where there is still servers in the background. There's, there's no magic involved in that. But it's servers that you don't manage. Uh, and cloud provider will manage the servers. Servers for you, with regards to patching up the software, uh, the OS, the hardware, all of that is abstracted away from you. So that when you build your services and deploy them, you only worry about your code and how to deploy it. Everything else is managed for you. So there are multiple servers on services on Azure that allow you to do that. Uh, Logic Apps, which is a low-code or no-code option, where you use the UI and you build the kind of workflow that that you would want. There's event grids. Event grids are any events that you want to get processed. You insert messages into event grid, and you have a separate service that listens on that that event. Uh, I just started web apps, where we don't care what the underlying infrastructure is. We just want our sites available. When it comes to 
as a storage of rock. So in as a storage, there's multiple different services like a lot of storage. There's uh, Azure storage queues as well, which we'll see later on. That, that allows you to have a serverless architecture where one server has add messages to a queue and another server will be as well. You have a decoupling. And having that decoupling in production is also one of the uh, best practices where if in the event that the service that these messages fails, not, nothing stops it from being corrected and leave the messages that was already pending. Cosmos DB as well, uh, that's a no SQL storage option on Azure. There's other options as well, other cloud providers that complement the DB on AWS. Uh, it is also SQL, which is a serverless option, and T-Vault. T-Vault is a service where you, you store credential, confidential information in T-Vault. So what are Azure Functions? So essentially Azure Functions is a piece of code that allows it to be invoked in multiple ways. You can invoke an Azure Function on a HTTP endpoint. You can also invoke it based on external events like a message being put into Cosmos DB or a message being put into I just saw it here, or even if a document gets updated in Cosmos, you can listen on those events and know something. In, in the data world, where, where we, like, one of the reasons we, we want to use Python is for image processing, as an example. And if, if we need to process hundreds of thousands of images at once, and we, we can have those URLs for the where the images look, and put that into IDQ, and we have thousands of Azure functions being triggered at once in a serverless way. And we have that scaling that we need in production that we generally wouldn't have if we have one service that is doing thousand things at once. The language support in Azure Functions. So Azure Functions support uh, many of the languages that you saw on the screen. From C sharp, Java, uh, F sharp, Java, Python as well, with the support framework. And this is for the support runtime of Azure Functions V4. So they are older versions, which is also supported, yeah, but the fact that the is always advise customers to use public Azure functions around the version. Um, the, the idea of the idea is that it's folded into well, in today's world, there are software that is running on old frameworks. So, what do we do with that? So, we've got to operate Mate for a little longer. Spend the time in updating those, or so what do we do with it? Um, so if they are Python frameworks, so uh, software that is running on version 2.7, the option so there is is to, wait, you can contain right so now, now this is the, name for the, machine the Python framework that you need for your app and deploy that to your function. So the framework is version 2.7. So from a Microsoft and Azure point, it doesn't matter what framework you're so this is part of the um, you can version 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 version. Version. Yeah. Yeah. It's not the entire thing, there's lots of them, but it's really the same. Azure Queues is a messaging service for storing uh, so details on each, each message can be up to 64 kilobytes, which is quite large. So and we only use the backlog of work to process. So if there's a backlog of Work that we need, you can put it in as if you have a separate service that listens for it. And as a function, it's scalable in the sense that if there's a hundreds of messages in the queue, then the hundred functions will be for you. And 
that's just the computation you have to like to do the thing. You don't need to do the thing. Yeah, for it. Yeah, the police manage those people. You need to record the data very, very quickly. The underlying infrastructure of the database. Very long baseline. Falls on Microsoft for uh, managing. It's one of the reasons you why just pay for hours. the amounts of data so that you stock, as well as the amount of data that you stock. Well, Microsoft has this unit of measurement for combining uh, GPU memory and uh, network costs and it will be made to like a metric that you want hundreds of hard drives. And in the old days, you can have a scalable uh, option where you only pay for what you need. If you Right now, you don't need any uh, power in your database, you don't pay for and it does the correlation. Uh, How much do you need that you require to pay for that? Um, so it's harder. That's why correlation is easier to use because it's just. So there are different serverless workflows that we can utilize in, in Azure Functions. Uh, one, of the op, uh, one of the examples that, that we have is of, uh, let's say we need to compute the speed of. New York, yellow taxi took a day, and we can use Azure Functions that we check our function, and that function computes all the distances of taxis. All of those functions that were called are collated into calling another function at the end, where you consolidate all your all the multiple different computations that you have to do in parallel. So you call a function, it scans out, and collects all of that into a Also game data visualization. Uh, Unity as well, based on what Unreal Engine, visualize Azure function to compute uh, data from, uh, from real time in game. Different patterns that we can use on Azure Functions. Uh, one of it is function chaining, where you want to trigger a specific set of functions one after the other. Each, each of the functions is also highly important in the sense that if that service fails, there will be a built in retry as well. So if there's any interruption to the function, there's nothing stopping the workflow from finishing entry. If function two has to fail, and then call function three and four and so on. That's one of the patterns. There are also others as well, like the fan in and out that I mentioned earlier. Where you invoke a function and that function needs to process data in parallel. So you can fan out and collect all the responses into a common one. An example of that is, let's say we want to back up a website. There's potentially millions of files in, in that makes up the site. So we call a uh, function F1 that backs up the site. But it goes to that folder and looks up all the files and for each file transfers somewhere else. So we can do all of that in the space of milliseconds as opposed to copy each file and wait for each one to get functions. So we can do things at a much faster speed than if we have to look at the same one way. If we have to do a backup of a site in this function, it will take way longer than this function. Async HTTP APIs is another pattern that is used where if there is a long running process that needs to be done, instead of your end user waiting for that to happen, you expose an API input to them where they can call and get the status of what, what the state of the pending task is. If you need to return a, a quick file, for example, you, 
the design of data pen was where they can find it. Human interaction as well. So if if your workflow relies on a user doing something, one of the ways that we can um, so in the DevOps world where we deploy at, at a high rate, and when it comes to production, we we want to have someone to approve the, the deployment. So we can request approval from from a manager or a stakeholder to to also integrate with with services like Kikita, where we can send an SMS and take an SMS back and say, okay, approve and the workflow continues. So even with workflows like this, even with human interaction, nothing stops the workflow. There's, the workflow is in a state where it's being approved and that continues when we get it. Aggregators as well. Uh, so if we want to process data over a period of time, we can send batches, batches of data as well to Azure Functions, and that will be processed over over long periods of time. And finally, a demo. Uh, are there any questions so far? Look at that. Word. It is massively terrible in the sense that you tell Microsoft what what type of machine you want. You you want something with like three things, but that's one in. So if you need to spin up a thousand functions, each of them will run on that as one instance. But if you need more, they is out of scale. And we'll see that here. So if we look at uh, one of the Azure functions that I've deployed before, there are options on Azure where you can configure scale out, where we can enforce a limit for we, we want to scale up to twice, or we want to scale out Well, it's a, it won't. Well, we set the maximum of what we want. So if we need one now, we have an influx of, we, we want to spin up a million functions, then Microsoft will manage that for you in the sense that they'll determine how many instances you, you require up to that maximum. They'll also scale up for the non serverless options. Under app 
So the pen, you, you uh, choose what, what type of pen that you want. And When we go to create a, a function, we, we choose what were the best options that we that we want. So in the serverless option, you don't have an option for choosing what type of hardware you want. But let's say we go with app service plan, and then for example. change what, what type of hardware. We have, we have 10 options isolated for, for the workloads that require isolation. So in, in production, of compared to isolation, the Microsoft hosted in servers are isolated in the isolated option, meaning that your, the infrastructure is not shared with other customers. In production, you have option for clean up your memory. So these are for one example. Many functions, but depending on what requirements of your software. If you need 3.5 gig for what you're running in one function, uh, you'll scale up with that. These costs are for the duration of your function. So if your function takes one second, you only pay for the one second. So you don't have hardware line and all that. a basic function app that leads from Azure Queue and take that message and put it in the, the puzzle and we'll check it out by putting a message on the queue and see that message. So this is just a blind code, so we're going to create all the resources that we need. And in VS Code, we have we have the VS Code extensions for Azure Storage, uh, for Azure Functions as well. So we can go and create a function directly from here. In your project, you can choose what what type of Azure function you want. So, if you wanted to code in Python, we can, and we can also choose what type of version we, we want. So, I'll choose 8.8. And what kind of function do we want? Do we want Azure Queue Storage Trigger, which I recently used, which will do that, and there's other options as well. Want to invoke the function on the HTTP. We can now give it a name. Uh, anything we want. Also, setting for any settings that we require. It also looks up my Azure storage account, uh, my Azure account, and finds out what storage accounts do I have available. And also, what what the the queue name is on Azure Storage. So we can call this anything. Call it. And that will go and now create all the boilerplate code that we need just for the Azure 
function part that is required to be reading from the table. So if you look at the requirements in the TXE, we will only see that there is just a function for the standard. And if we now go and run it, if, okay, let's take a look at the index file first. So it goes, it reads the message from a queue, and it logs it to the console. Trigger is now available. And let's go back to uh, storage account. And we see that there is a queue option. So there is the older one. And we'll now go get the new queue. New queue, we can go and add a message. And let's say we we'll put the name of So that item was created, and we'll see that that message was already checked. So the message was put into Microsoft Office, but my function is running locally. So there's also built-in resize. So if the message that was put into the queue is well found in some way, your function would fail. Or if for some reason your function fails, but that message that was taken out gets put into a poison queue. Like if you have to look at the previous example that I had, where Azure functions, if you can't process the message, it won't just remove it from the queue and put it in a poison queue. And we'll see that there are some messages that are want to So we can go and take this message and put it back into the main thing that we get processed if we want to. And now we can go add uh, some. So if if we recap on the previous slide that I had, there's the concept of input bindings and output bindings. Input bindings are the events that we want to invoke our function with. Right? A message being put into queue, right? HTTP checker. Those are input bindings, and we define that in our function JSON file, where we just have the input bindings of queue storage, so a message being put into queue. But we can also define output binding where our function does something, and at the end of it, it needs to output something. So we can define output binding in a similar way that we do input, but the difference is that the direction is output. Instead of a queue name, we'll have, um, this is all on the Microsoft docs, so we can, So what are the other options that we require for output binding? Uh, a database name and a collection name. Uh, 
So let's say we want to name our database Python array and name of the collection the Chibita data. And we require a connection string to Plasma. So on Azure, if I go to Cloud DB, I'll have multiple Cosmos DB accounts, so this one is in US. And we can go to Data Explorer and see what database we have, what collections we have. So let's say we want a database of the name. So we want a database name Python array and a collection name is data. Yeah, as well, you, you choose the type of cost you want to use uh, for the level of what, what services you run. So you require at least 300 RUs. There's also a calculation that Michael does for how much you would pay for that level of service. That's just the database, and we can go and create a new container and storage data. At the moment, there's no Connection stream to Cosmos. That we can go and add in our local settings. And just to get the name of it. Now we've, we've configured an output binding thing, but we haven't told the function to go and put the message out to the problem. So in our function, we can define what that. So we, we gave it the name of doc. So in now in, in the function, we will say that doc is of type. So this output function of, of doc is the document in Cosmos DB, and we can here just say that as a bit of a, so yeah. So we can go and set that document to 
that JSON that we've got in the HTTP request. So it needs to be JSON, and we'll see that in when we run it. That if if the message that we put into the queue is not valid JSON, then you know error out in the function and we'll see what that looks like. As soon as we put the message of hello, there will be an error in the function, meaning that the document that we tried to set couldn't be easily realized into a JSON format. So it's throw an error. And if we go back to the queues, we'll see that now there's also a poison tree, which has the message of hello. So even though our function didn't run successfully, that we put is not lost. So we can go and have So we try and have the framework built into the framework where we can, we can run these on our local machines as well as what's in production. So the error that we encounter locally is what we expect in production as well. When it comes to frameworks, um, we try and use the latest framework as possible. And when it comes to running functions at scale, there's also built in monitoring as well that comes within Azure as a whole, like within Azure Monitor that uh, looks at your infrastructure, but there's also application insights that give you insights into uh, your application. So if we go to one of the functions that I have, there's probably no calls made to these functions, but there is an application insights that give you diagnostic information of how you are having this running in The number of failed requests, the response times, what the availability is like. So availability of zero means that since there's no calls made to the function, you don't have a function as well, as long as with is a call to the function, then only have so I mean that we're not changing. The number of server requests, response time, failed requests, 
Yeah, well, we can zoom deeper into what happens when our functions are getting different. Over a period of time, that means it's the last hour, seven days. Yeah, so that's how we would manage that in the last hour. See the data that's coming out of the application inside. We can even move the monitoring that we want as well. 